and now ready to finally close out this amazing year of TED Talks, Melissa Lopez. Um, before I start, I just want to give some thanks, like Rohan did. First to Miss Avarvia, wherever she is. She's put a lot of trust in Rohan and I, um, <laughs> probably more than uh, was warranted. But that's to Miss Avarvia, to Ethan um, for putting up with Rohan and I, and for Rohan for just like working with me through all of this. So, with that, I'll begin my talk. So. If any of you know me, you know that I am always, always hungry. Food is always on my mind. I love to eat. Yeah, and so like I said, when food is always on your mind, um, a lot of big decisions in your life are made around food. And so this has been present in work, in school, and in play. So first, let's look at work. Well, my first job, I decided in sophomore year that I wanted to be a baker. And so I did just that. I went to the local bakery in Paoli, I filled out an application, and I worked at a French bakery for six months and learned about French baking and croissants and eclairs and elephant ears. Uh, and it was all good and well until I wasn't getting paid, and so I left. And I moved on to my next restaurant escapade, and I worked at a local Italian restaurant in Wayne, where I was surrounded by a lot of uh, really talented chefs and I learned about <coughs> northern Italian cuisine and Neapolitan pizza and I would rummage through the scraps in the back to try to get some because I couldn't afford it. Um, but again, there was a falling out here. Not the point. I don't work here anymore, but learned a lot. So that's work. What about school? Well, I'm a part of Greening Stoga and as you probably saw in the courtyard during Earth Day today, we do a lot with plants. We grow a lot of produce. <laughs> Dan. Um, we grow a lot of produce organically, and with that produce, we donate it to the Chester County Food Bank. And from there, it goes to local food cupboards, and people in our community who don't have access to healthy food are eating that. So, that is school. And finally, for play, some of you might know me as Mother's Little Helper. And this is a blog that when I decide to run every other, like, six months or so, um, it celebrates the marriage between my passions for food and music and the euphoric experience and the sensory experience that happens when you bring them together. And the title of that sort of is play on words, an ode to the Rolling Stones song, Mother's Little Helper, but also Mother's Little Helper in the Kitchen. So, what have I learned through all of this? Well, I've really changed my outlook about food. It's become more than just an immediate need to satiate my hunger, right? Now I really do adopt the maxim that you are what you eat. I believe that what we ingest is who we are. When I, a lot of people, when they want to learn about others, they look at people's libraries, they look at their books, and see what that says about them. I like to have a meal with someone and sit down and ask, what is this person eating? What are they not eating? How are they eating it? And why? So I think that along with clothing and shelter, Food is a basic necessity that we've inflated in our, in our culture to indicate a mood, to preserve a value, um, and so on and so forth. So in this talk, I'm going to look at several spheres of life, whether that be culture, history, art, literature, and see what that says about us as a community. See what that says about our traditions, about our values, um, about our emotions and ourselves. So let's get started. As with the title of this talk, I view the world through my stomach, and I think that that might resonate with a lot of you. It's safe to say that Idaho is a potato, right? Um, New England, collectively, a lobster roll. But close to home, let's talk about the Philadelphia cheesesteak, right guys? Let's see what this says about us. So, first I'm gonna ask you guys some questions. When you're gonna order a cheesesteak, where do you go? Pats or Geno's? Right. You're both wrong, gyms. So um, there's that device and this within it. And then, how do you order your cheesesteak? Do you order it with whiz? Do you order it without whiz? With pro? How do you order it? So everyone has their own preferences with this. And we can look at the Philadelphia cheesesteak in a Philadelphia cheesesteak shop as a microcosm for. Philadelphia culture. We even just saw there that we can look at Philadelphia local loyalties. We can look at Philadelphia linguistics. Um, 
all through the cheesesteak and how it's sort of an artifact of over 100 years of Philadelphia's blue collar tradition and really tells part of the history of our city. So going off of that, the idea that food can tell, uh, tell us a lot about our history, um, I'm going to show you a brief video about the evolution of lunches in America in the 20th into the 21st century. And I'm just going to ask you throughout the decades to think about what's going on in America during these times and then try to relate that to the meals. We're going to fast forward. And um, it's not a coincidence that her name is Lolita. 
um, it's actually supposed to be pronounced lolly to, to make the connection with lollipop. So that's literature. Now I think that we can also look at just some of the everyday foods that we eat and look at to the significance that we assign to those. So first we have bread. We often look at bread as the essential part of life. Um, our ancestors used bread just as a means of survival. It had a lot of essential nutrients and grains in there. In religion, it's essential to Christianity and it's part of the Eucharist. You bring bread and um, it's representative of Jesus' body. But it's also a socially essential item in a lot of cultures, the precursor to a lot of meals in the beginning of um, a party or a dinner. Next we have cake. So we can all look at cake as a symbol of celebration, whether that be birthdays or anniversaries or weddings. Um, and even the actual ritual of cutting the cake says something. On your birthday, when you cut the cake, you blow out candles and make a wish. When you get married, you, it's the first unifying act that you have with your spouse. So there's some things there. And then we have comfort foods, right? Macaroni has special powers that soothe our soul, right? Um, same is true of Ben and Jerry's. So we can see here that our relationship with food um, is an emotional one as well. And even more so than that, dining can be a gendering experience. Females tend to gravitate more towards lighter foods, perhaps because of body image. And the kitchen is more the realm of the woman versus meat, which is a manly food. And the grill is a man's territory, right? <laughs> so <coughs> I've talked about how food can be literature, how it can be history, it can be culture and art and emotion. But I think that right now, food is really taking the form of politics in our current age. Um, as Lucas had talked about in his talk, we're a generation that's very skeptical of the government, and that skepticism is carried over. A lot of what I talked about before in the symbolism in food is what society has sculpted, how they've um, developed our perceptions and interpretations of the food that we eat. But as a society now, we're questioning what, so what society has long told us about food. We're asking what's in our food? Where does it come from? How is it grown? Is it ethical? Um, and in that same vein, we're using the same thing that we're questioning food and using it as a tool to make change. Years before this, no one identified themselves by their dietary choices. No one said, I'm a vegan, or I'm a local whore, or I'm a weekday vegetarian. Like, these weren't things, right? Um, but today, we use them as modifiers, as self-identifiers. Um, and I think what I'm trying to come down to here is that a lot of you in this room might feel separated from this food revolution that I'm talking about, or even this connection to food. You might think, oh yeah, I watched a BuzzFeed video about food, I tried it, it didn't work, I take pictures of my pizza. Um, but really the point that I'm coming to here is that food is becoming a means of social currency. And that's extending beyond um, the distinguishment between classes. It's a way to convey a value or a moral. We're leveraging the power of the fork now to a larger scale. And so, really what I'm asking you guys to do is look at your plates and see what it says about you. We make the choice to eat three times a day, and that's pretty powerful. So, I'll leave you with this quote. Uh, it's by a French gastronomy, and in French it says, Dis-moi ce que tu manges, je peux te dire ce que tu es. And in English that means, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you what you are. Thank you. relationship between the food choices that you make 
and who you are. So for example, I poked a joke at myself saying weekday vegetarian. I actually am that. Um, <laughs> so during the week I don't eat any meat and that's because I decided that meat um, has a large environmental footprint. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's up for you to decide, but in that sense, it can be in a reflection of your values and who you are. Can you describe yourself as what food? What would you be in mind? I've thought about this. I think I'm 72% dark chocolate. Yeah. What's other? Yeah. No, it's like. Uh, no. I had a BLT for lunch. Oh, I do count it. Yeah. How about Sundays? I eat meat on Sundays. <laughs> yeah. Well, why did. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question? Or no? Did you have a question? What's your favorite Ben and Jerry's flavor? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, probably fish food or Cherry Garcia. Yeah. Was there a significant point where you like really kind of got this concept and just kind of rolled with it? Yeah, I think that it was like when I was developing the concept for my blog. And I've been like looking at this idea for more than just even like the development of the TED Talk. Like I wrote my college essay on this and Mrs. Light has actually helped me a lot with this. And um, I think that like when I solidified that concept that there can be other connections to food beyond just like just means of survival, that's really when it hit me. So like through the blog, I would say. And also, if any of you guys like look at the website, the last time I edited it, all of the recipes got deleted, except for one. So just FYI. Are you a fan of the band fish? Um, I'm actually not. That's a so, <laughs> fan. Listen to their music. Yeah, I mean, Are you a fan? I was more of a fan with the, of a, the John Mayer version of Dead and Company. Okay. Oh, but, I mean, yeah. the triple that's good. Yeah. So. <laughs>